never miss school, so it's kind of silly, but they're there. Um, so I asked you to show directional selection, and most people showed it correctly, and allele frequency shifting to the right. So well, it's kind of a little leaning power of directional selection. Okay. What is that? <laughs> What's, I just, what? You have, I, oh, dear. Oh, I'm getting out of here. All right. So, you guys, the last universal common ancestor, LUCA, is common to all organisms that live and have lived. So, we're going to be talking about all those fun eras and periods and mass extinctions in this chapter. Now, today we say that life only comes from life. <coughs> However, the first cells had to arise from non-living chemicals. So, I love this chapter fold for one reason. You get to actually try to discuss all of the different ways that life could have evolved. And when I say life, I mean the biomolecules of life. Not just where did the chicken come from, but where did the protein from the chicken come from, right? The whole chicken and the egg debate really doesn't make sense when you break it down to the biomolecular level. Because the real question is, you know, what came first? Um, you know, a, a micelle or a phospholipid bilayer? And that, we're going to talk about that today. And then we'll talk about, like, what came first, RNA or DNA? You know, what came first, RNA or a protein? And those are the real questions in biology. I leave the chicken and the egg argument for, like, Plato and Socrates and all the theologists of the world. Because that really doesn't matter when it gets down to it. It's really which biomolecule showed up first. So the Earth came into being about 4.6 billion years ago. How do we know that? Radiometric dating. If you don't believe in chemistry, I can't help you there. Oh, you know, if you're going to have a... Sounds like a good day for a personal day. Just take that. <laughs> okay. So the Earth's mass provides a gravitational field strong enough to hold an atmosphere. I didn't say it doesn't matter. I said it doesn't matter in biology. Oh. Well, it is matter. That's what we're talking about, right? I think it's like an, an amino group is an NH2. That's part of amino acid. That's matter. Nitrogen, hydrogen. Oh, yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter. I'll agree with that. I'm good with that. Andrew's just trying to misquote her so that way he Yeah. <laughs> Me and Ms. Schaefer laugh about this all the time. So you guys, it's like the ongoing debate of significant digits. Yes. I like the last Daphne I walked in, I go, I go, your kids sig dig me the whole hour. That's <laughs> like all they did is kept talking about significant digits. And I was just trying to get them to understand the Hardy Weinberg principle. All right, so most likely consists of water vapor, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and small amounts of hydrogen, methane, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and carbon monoxide. Let's talk about some of that matter up there that matters. Okay? Water. Pretty important, right? Yeah, like think about carbohydrates. Can you have a carbohydrate without water? No, that's part of the word, right? Hydrate. Okay. Can you have proteins, folks? Shh. Can you have pro? I don't have time to, to deal with other things right now. Okay, like chemistry class. I'll leave that there. We are going to be talking about chemistry today, though, a little bit. So nitrogen, NH2. We just talked about that as being a very important part of amino acids. You cannot have the monomers of proteins without nitrogen. And then, of course, carbon, CO2. We are carbon-based life, life forms. All of the biomolecules, whether you're talking about a nucleic acid, a lipid, uh, um, okay, nucleic acid was wrong with me, and a, or a carbohydrate, all of those biomolecules are from a carbon structure, whether it's a carbon uh, branched carbon uh, chain, whether it's a straight carbon chain, whether it's a carbon ring, an aromatic ring. They are all carbon-based structures. So there's little free oxygen that was available. As, uh, originally, it was too hot for liquid water to form, so all of the water was not in the oceans. Now imagine a planet, our planet, not a planet, imagine our planet being so hot 
where all the water was not on the surface. Okay, it was in like basically not an atmosphere, but just in this biosphere. Okay, um, I shouldn't even call it a biosphere because life wasn't quite there yet. So as the Earth cooled, water vapor condensed to liquid water. So as our planet cooled, we know what happens when condensation occurs, precipitation, the whole water cycle began, and thus begins the ability to have liquid water and the ability to start forming the primordial soup that we've all heard of before. Okay. So looking at the evolution of monomers, we just talked about some. You cannot have polymers without monomers. So the very simplest things that would have had to form would have been these very first monomers. So there are several hypotheses that suggest how monomers evolved. And monomers, we know, uh, have came from outer space. This is the first one. Okay. Now, comets and meteorites perhaps carried organic chemicals and have pelted the Earth throughout history. So this is one of the theories, you guys. I mean, it is plausible because we know when meteors hit our planet, they do contain strands of RNA. That's creepy, right? Just a little bit, maybe? No? Well, how about this? Where do meteors come from? Let's see, let's see what you guys... Let's see, oh, black hole. Let's see what Earth science has done for you. Where do meteors come from? Oh, dear Lord. Oh, dear. Yeah. Oh, folks, come on. Now. We can't talk about that. We've got to steer clear of that. Rocks. Okay. God, rocks. Okay. All right. A white hole. Yes. Same space spaghetti. Is it Le part? Some of them, yeah. Okay, I can. All right. So what if I told you that basically meteors are either pieces of our planet or other planets or other uh, asteroids from the Kuiper's Belt or wherever they might have come from that have broken off and been sent into orbit, okay? Because an object stays in motion until acted upon by another force, and we know out in space there's nothing there, there's no matter, so there's no force, right? So there's no friction, yeah, it's just going to keep going. It's kind of weird. Anybody see gravity? Yeah, that's kind of a cool for me a little bit. So it's kind of a trick question because you can't really see gravity until it like acts on something, but I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that gravity joke all the time. I haven't used that one yet. That's the first one. So let's, let's jump back and, and think about it. So how did our moon get here? Well, let's really test your... How did the moon get here? Do not come up with a weird Socrative answer. Please give me a real answer. How did the moon get here? It broke off the Earth. That is how it got here. You're not kidding. That's for real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Long time ago, we got hit by a meteor, right? Okay. Uh, no, it's not from the formation of the solar system. Uh, yep. As it is good to be wrong. I like that. So. Planet-like object struck Earth. Yep. Not quite planet, but pretty dang big. Planet-like, but not not in size. Oh wow! I always heard it was a lot smaller. They think it was almost <laughs> Broke off with Duffy sneeze. All right. <laughs> Duffy, you're old, man. 4.6 billion years ago? Wow. All right. So, a big space rock. I like that. So, one of those god rocks, right? Okay. So, now, the reason I'm talking about that isn't just to, to you know, test our Earth knowledge, but... Really, why would a meteor have RNA in it? Well, the meteor very well could have came from Earth, right? And so there might be RNA from Earth floating around out there, and it comes back and smacks us again because it's in our orbit, right? Think about meteors hitting the planet. Okay? Yeah, so, and this, is, this does punch holes in this theory a little bit. I like to think of all the possibilities. But one of the big problems is you never know really where that meteor came from. And, well, sometimes we do. Uh, but if that if that meteor has RNA on it, it could very well be from like something hitting the moon along or the pl the planet a long time ago making the moon and that chunk breaking off and coming back in our orbit. So we don't really know where that RNA originated from. 
it's kind of cool to look at it and say, yeah, these meteors have like genetic material on them. It's kind of fun. If, if that's fun to you, right? So we look at organic molecules that could have seeded the, uh, seeded the chemical origin of life on Earth. So it could have came from another planet. I kind of like that idea. It sounds like a sci-fi movie, right? Uh, Bacterium-like cells could have been carried to Earth on a meteorite or a comet. There are organisms on this planet that can literally survive the heat of the sun. They're on the tree outside. They're called uh, tardigrades. You guys ever heard of a tardigrade? Some people call them woolly bears. They can withstand the solar radiation of the sun and be put in water and come back to life. That's crazy, right? But they can. They go into, uh, into a crystallic uh, spore form, into a structure that can withstand it. Yes. Yep, they're called woolly bears, water bears. Yeah. We can try. You know what? We will go get some lichen today. We will see if we can find. I give them 24 hours to warm up and see if they can come to life. Okay. So we'll we'll get some lichen. See if they're liking it. <laughs> Sorry. So monomers came from the reaction in the atmosphere. Remember operon theory? I don't know if you guys remember operon. Um, and Haldane, but their hypothesis came from the early 1900s. We mentioned them back in biology. They suggested that organic molecules could be formed in the presence of outside energy sources using atmospheric gases. So they came up with that experiment with all of those gases in those tubes. They heated up the tube, came to the top, they put like a spark plug up on the top, it gave it like lightning, things like that. And then as things condensed and cooled, on the other side, you'd have biomolecules. I actually did this one in college, it's kind of fun. Um, they have a lab set up where you can actually re reproduce this operon experiment. Basically, you take nitrogen gas, a mixture of all of these salts and things on the, on the one side, heat them up, spark up at the top to simulate lightning in the atmosphere, and as they condense through the tube, you have a condensation tube, and as they fall over here, and then you test them for things like proteins and nucleic acids and fats, you actually can create those from nothing over here. So we can get biomolecules from nothing. And when I say nothing, I really mean a lot of elements mixed together, right? Okay? So it's not like you didn't start with any, but, you, but in this process of adding energy, you make new biomolecules. Okay? So monomers came from the reactions at hydrothermal vents. Why? Yes? Do I believe it? I'm, my mind is absolutely sure of it. Can I go back in the time machine? No, not yet. Not yet, right? That's the trip I want to pay forward on, not the trip to the moon. You know they're selling million-dollar tickets to the moon right now? That's kind of cool. But they haven't built a, built a spacecraft yet. Oh, they have them for Mars, too. Yeah. Yeah, just, you want to go? <laughs> so... This leads to the Stan Stanley Miller experiment. This was uh, conducted an experiment to test the Oprin and Haldane hypothesis. That's what I was referring to. This showed that gases, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water can react with one another to produce small organic molecules like amino acids and organic acids, um, like fatty acids. So this is the one that I was referring to where you can actually reproduce what uh, Oprin had suggested. And you need strong energy sources to do this. Well, the Earth had the sun and lots of lightning because that early atmosphere was very, very um, what would be the, uh, violent or very unstable, we'll say. Rainfall would have washed organic compounds from the atmosphere into the ocean, and they would have accumulated in the ocean, making it an organic soup. Well, this sounds awesome, except for one thing what would have early Earth been missing that it now has? That whole idea is great. I can do it in a lab. I can even prove how it could have happened. What is the one problem with this theory? There is a problem. What would, have Earth, what would early Earth have been missing that would have disallowed this to be? In 
Oxygen? No, I had oxygen. Not a lot, but I had it. <coughs> no one came up with it. Huh. So what protects us from UV rays? Uh, so UV rays will literally, it's like an autoclave, right? Think about our planet as a giant autoclave because we didn't have an atmosphere. So would have an organic molecule or any like larger molecule beyond a monomer been able to survive that type of radiation? No. no. It's a good thing there are other sources on our planet, right? So, but anyway, this is the actual experiment. You heat up all of those gases, or I'm sorry, that, that mixture that we talked about with water, then you mix that with gases, ammonium, nitrogen, hydrogen, um, you know, the NH is extremely important because that's where you get the ability to make an amino acid. And then if you add, this is a little spark plug here, you have a cathode and an anode, this would be an anode over here. So you run a current through that, makes little sparks, kind of a cool setup really when you look at it. It's like having a spark plug in there. This will end up, as things condense, it will make those fatty acids and amino acids and some of the other very simple monomers. Okay. And you can do this in a lab, start off with nothing all of these simple elements, and they'll end up with the monomers for life, which is kind of cool because you can prove that it is feasible if you have energy. Where else on the planet is there energy besides from lightning and the sun? Where else on our planet is there a lot of energy? Do, 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 do. Five, four, three, two, one. See what you came up with. Yep, the Earth, the Earth's core radiation, geothermal vents. I like that one. Hydrogeothermal vents. Yeah, hydrothermal vents. Perfect. Okay. Wind. Yeah. But surface of the Earth, no good, right? So heat from deep in, deep in the core coming up through those geothermal and hydrothermal, very specifically, vents. So we, we, we showed you like uh, the pea glow gene, which could only glow when UV light hit it, and that's from the very bottom of the ocean. You go down deep enough, and you can't even penetrate UV rays, right? So think of this huge barrier protecting the very depths of the ocean where these geothermal vents are. And that would be the source of these early monomers and where they would have had the energy. Now, the other stuff could happen at the surface later once the atmosphere was developed. But very early, it would have had to have been at these underwater hydrothermal vents. Yes? Well, they do. But I mean even lower than them. Sorry, go below them. Okay. Sorry about that. That was my misspoken word. So this, this is what they look like. We've all seen the Discovery Channel where these uh, geothermal vents are spewing methane. So then I start to think of these things called methanogens. You guys remember methanogens and those extremophiles from last year? No? Yeah, the ones that can go through chemiosmosis, make their own energy from methane. Okay? And so just understanding that at the bottom of the ocean, we can actually go down there and observe monomers forming from these geothermal vents by taking samples. It's pretty cool. So that means that the monomers of life right now are still being made down at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, very simple monomers. Which, you know, gives us hope for the planet, right? If, if everything becomes extinct, you know, 4.6 billion years later, we're good. No? So in cells, monomers join to form polymers in the process of enzymes, which, oh man, need an enzyme now. What are enzymes? Proteins, right? So if enough monomers would have come together to form polypeptides, because I would imagine that the first protein was not a functional thing, or first polypeptide was not a functional protein, eventually, if enough of them were being made in many different combinations, they would start to form functions. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. 
But the first hypothesis we need to look at is the iron sulfur world hypothesis, and this suggests that or organic molecules reacted with amino acids to form peptides in the presence of iron nickel sulfide. So this is suggesting that the amino acids would have formed first. I kind of like that, simpler to more complex. And then there's the protein first hypothesis that assumes that protein enzymes arose first, then assembling other amino acids from their base structure, and that DNA came afterwards. And that was a little more complicated, so my mind, like, for some reason doesn't like that one. And then there's the RNA first hypothesis that suggests only RNA was needed to progress toward formation of the first cell or cells, because there is self-replicating RNA out there. And that DNA genes came afterwards. I like that one. My biotech mind gets that one. But then I go back to, well, how'd the protein get there? The chicken and the egg conversation at a molecular level, right? Oh. Makes the chicken and the egg argument seem kind of dumb now, a little bit. Let's see what you got. I'm going to poll the audience. What do you guys think? There's no right or wrong here. What do you guys think came first, the protein or the RNA? Protein or RNA? What do you guys think? And I'll tell you, there's no, I mean, no one can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, both can be proven, but in isolated experiments, right? Oh, some of them thinks DNA came first. Hmm. Throwing a curveball in there, literally like a helical ball, right? It's a curve. That's a new, it's a new pitch. Oh my God. What if you? Can't? I've seen that one on old cartoons where it goes like that. Is it Daffy Duck that throws that one? The double helix? All right. Maybe it was Buddy. It was Buddy Buddy, all right. Oh, well, it depends on the, how long I think about it. I would say amino acid first, then protein. And the mystery between how RNA would have worked with that protein, and then I started thinking about that, and I go, oh, there's no way, and you need directions to assemble them, so I know, right, and it, it, I can go back and forth all day in my head about it. Yeah, no one knows. It is. Tough. 4.6 billion years ago, right? So before the first true cell arose, let's talk about something simpler than all of that complex thinking. Let's talk about something that must have come before you could actually have an encasement for life. What do we call that structure that holds life in place and allows everything to be isolated? The membrane, right? Okay, which is made of phospholipids, okay? So what it, how many tails does a phospho, each phospholipid have? Two. Do you think it started off with one tail or two, two tails? One tail, right? All right. Before you have a tail of two cities, you've got to have a tail about just one. So before the first true cell arose, there would have been a protocell or a protobiont, and the hypothesis precursor to the first true cells. And this is going to lead into my cells and things like that. When I say my cells, I'm not talking about my cells. I'm talking about very early cells. Okay. So a protocell would have an outer membrane and carry on energy metabolism, which means it would have a source for chemiosmosis, which would involve an enzyme. Does anybody know the enzyme? Um, that, we, that drives all of our energy production and a lot of bacterial reproduction or respiration as well? It's ATP synthase. Okay. So proteinoids are small polypeptides with catalytic properties. So there are things simpler than enzymes that facilitate chemical reactions but are not folded as structural proteins. They're called proteinoids. And when proteinoids are placed in water, they form these structures called microspheres. They're like little fat protein bubbles. And these structures are made of proteins with many properties of a cell. And if lipids are made available to microspheres, lipids become associated with microspheres, producing a lipid protein membrane. So here's all of that 
gibberish right there. Let me just have it make sense to you. If I take a bunch of phospholipids and I mix them with a bunch of proteins and I put them in water, are parts of the lipids repelled by the water? Yes. And if I'm a phospholipid, part of me is what to water? Attracted, the phosphate head that has the oxygen electronegativity, right? Okay. Now, proteins, they fold many times. Remember that protein lab we did? Some ends are attracted to water and some are repelled, giving its folded structure. So because of that, and other ends are, of that protein are also attracted to water, because of their similar properties to the phospholipids, they actually work together. And they form these microspheres, which contain both fats, phospholipids, and proteins. Okay? Now, you guys, I know, are smart enough to understand the cell membrane structure and protein structure. And if you put them together, you can see how they would make a, a bubble together, hiding from water and also attracted to it at the same time. So lipids placed into a water form cell-sized double-layered bubbles called liposomes. Lipo means fat, okay? So these are, these are these little fat bubbles. And these may have provided that first membranous boundary. Now, we're not saying that they were cells yet, okay? They're just the very precursors of cells, giving these enzymes a habitat or an enclosed, isolated habitat. I just said isolated, didn't I? What happens in isolation? Everybody say evolution. Evolution, okay? So here we have the ability now to isolate biomolecules, right? Now think of that as a mountain between one type and the other, one type of enzyme and another. And they, now let's say they float apart in a big giant ocean, right? It's the whole planet. And how all the different types of proteins that would be doing this simultaneously all over the globe. And now you start to think about all the polypeptides that probably existed inside of these liposomes and all the different fat bubbles that would have existed because we had this mixture that was just being churned around called the primordial soup on our planet. Okay. Now, there's no way, there's no way for scientists to predict or even go back in time and figure out what existed because, again, we aren't going to get fossils from these, right? So when I talk about single-tailed phospholipids, I, what I'm talking about is the development of what's called a protocell membrane. If I get fatty acids coming together, to form, I'm sorry, two fatty acids coming together to form a phospholipid, they can develop that cell membrane. Now, imagine a double, a double layer of single-tailed phospholipids, okay, still having a hydrophilic head, still having a hydrophobic tail, but structured slightly differently, different fatty acids, different lipids, forming a protocell. So if I mention a protocell, I'm basically talking about a membrane made up of phospholipids with a single tail. If we're talking about a cell membrane, we're talking about two fatty acid tails on the phospholipid the way you guys have learned it thus far. So if I mention a fatty acid bilayer, I'm not talking about the cell membrane. Please identify with that. That's a tricky one on a test. You guys all right? Oh, yeah, I can go back. So on a test, you, you might get a question that asks about a fatty acid bilayer. Know that I'm talking about a protocell membrane and not a cell membrane. Okay? If I say a phospholipid bilayer, I'm definitely talking about a cell membrane, not a protocell membrane. So then we start thinking about all the different fat bubbles inside of our cell. And that makes me think of a lysosome. What's a lysosome? They break things down. It is essentially one of these, a plasmid membrane filled with digestive enzymes. So let's just think about inside of our cells. Forget about what's in front of you for a minute. Just conceptually think of your cell as being planet Earth for a moment. One cell, okay? Let's, let's just think about a stomach cell, okay? And inside of that, that cell, you have these little fat bubbles little phospholipid bubbles that have enzymes, which are proteins, right, inside of them. And then you have some other ones, too. You have other fat bubbles, which have other things in them that do other things. Some of them contain proteins for shipping out of the cell and things like that, which are all made by your endoplasmic 
reticulum, which is this plasma membrane making machine, this vesicle making machine. And then you start to really think about the complexity of a cell, right? Your cell represents the early primordial soup in a little tiny closed in area, isolated and evolved and specialized inside of you. Okay? So now think about how your cells are all different than each other. And then you should really start to think about the environments that they were influenced by, all in different ways to get all of who you are. Now just rewind the clock till there wasn't any multicellular organisms, not any single-celled organisms. How did that get to be here? That's what we're talking about. Okay? So these vesicles would have been some of the very first things to show up that would have represented a cell. Okay? Yeah, this one, yeah. This one's fun because you get to really start to think biologically, like, where did we come from? And you all, in our minds all go, right? Okay. So, these micelles even simpler, right? We're talking about a micelle having those single tailed structures, which could have also, and they do break off of these fat bubbles as well. Try to have that conversation with the average Joe on the street. That doesn't work. No. So, evolution of the protocell. I'm actually going to stop here, okay? I've, I've probably drained a lot of your um, intense thinking out of your head right now, so I'm going to kind of stop. Plus, I have a meeting coming up very shortly. So this is a good, this is a good stopping point and a good starting point for tomorrow.